Welcome. everyone to how to buy your first dental practice challenge. My name is Paul, Dr. Nacho Goodman. Super excited to be here to help you figure out this wacky world of owning your own dental practice, uh, making a mess of your ice pop like my daughter is okay making a mess of buying your first practice is not okay. This challenge is designed to be super fun, super free, and super helpful. Please share any questions that you have in the chat so we can answer them because the most important person here is you. You are the most important person. Please share your questions, comments, and concerns with me. I would love to customize how I can help you for maximum impact. If you do not want to share your questions in the chat, I know some of this stuff I think is confidential. Who are we going to tell? We're not going to tell anyone. There's also an anonymous way to share that question, but you can also text it to this number. That is my community text hotline. The Nacho team gets it too. They can bring that to me here. This is going to be designed to be sitcom style. I'm a child of the 80s, Family Ties, Cheers, Growing Pains, all those shows are sitcoms. Pay attention for 22 minutes, commercials for, for eight minutes, 30 minutes, but we're gonna answer questions throughout. We're gonna have multiple parts to this series. This episode one is going to focus on how to avoid making a $30,000 mistake like I did, how to avoid making a $30,000 mistake like I did when buying a dental practice. So as we get some more people filtering in here, you're going to see me in a second. You see my face on screen already. So why do you want to buy a dental practice? You know, you're here, you're listening. Put in the chat, why do you want to own a dental practice for the adoring fans? for the fame, for the fortune, for control over your crown preps so you can be the boss, do you wanna be the boss? So think about this for a minute. I'll let this question sit for a little bit. Why do you want to buy a dental practice? And I'll also share some common things people tell me, dental associates, sometimes dental students, but why do you wanna buy? Think about that because your why is so important. I would love if you would share in the chat your why. You can do it. I see people here already who I know. I won't shout you out, but I see basketball fan number one. I don't know if he's happy. The Sixers have moved on at the time of this recording. They moved on to round two. His team, I don't think, has moved on, but why do you want to buy a dental practice? Great. So I thank you for answering. I want to be my own boss and have control over the procedures. I do and the materials that I use. Thank you for answering. Give that person a $50 Nacho CE gift code for being the first person to answer. See, be the first person to answer, you win prizes. So now you guys can see my face. Well, you see my face, two faces at one time. So growing up, I wanted to be a doctor, dentist, or lawyer. My dad was an awesome dad, amazing mentor, amazing dentist. He always said there was a value in being your own boss. So being your own boss is a double-edged sword. You have a lot of control, but you also have a lot of risk, but that is a common reason. You want more control. You want to be your own boss. So how do you get this dental practice? But what are some of the benefits of owning your own dental practice? You can set your own schedule. You can choose the materials that you want to use. You can do the dentistry you want to do. You don't want to do endo? Refer it right out. Go right down the street to the endodontist, wherever the endodontist works. So there's some benefits. You can work seven to seven, three days a week if that fits your schedule and you can find a team to do that. So there are definitely some benefits to owning your dental practice. Your income potential as a practice owner most of the time is higher than as an associate, most of the time. But can anyone share with me what has happened in our dental space that's created associates? And I don't know if the word associates right for this type of dentist. So I think of a dental associate, someone like I have multiple dental associates. They work with my brother and I, the practice owners. They're associates in our practices. They might work three days a week, they might work four days a week, but there is an associate out there. Who do they work for? And many of them make more money than more practice owners. So who are the associates? Where do they work when they make more money than a lot of practice owners? Does anyone know the answer to that question? Where do associates exist in this newish dental space? They're making more money than practice owners. So a golden nacho tip to embrace that when I got out of dental school, all of my friends were associates. And I was associate for a short period of time myself. We all made more money when we became owners, but that doesn't happen. I sell practices. I help dentists buy practices. And I talk to this type of dentist. I say, here's a great practice. It does $700,000 a year. Owner has 50% overhead. You could make $350,000 a year after debt service. Maybe that's $270,000 a year. And they say, oh, but I make 
$1,500 a day working 200 days a, a year at my associate job. Where do they usually work when they make a lot of money as an associate? Does anyone know that answer? Does anyone know what answer where? My friend said no NBA talk. Uh, here, that was my failed dream, being an NBA basketball player. So where do they work? They work at DSOs. So why can you shoot threes of production like Steph Curry at a DSO? Because you were replacing a practice owner who owned that practice and was super productive. So something to learn, something to know. Maybe you're a dental student. Maybe you're someone who's selling a practice. Maybe you're in the middle. Associates at DSOs can earn significantly high income because they are replacing a previous practice owner who the DSO bought the practice from. So DSO associates, which I think should be its own separate category versus private practice associates. So most of the time, if you work for a private practice, you are going to earn more money as a practice owner. So that's a benefit of owning a dental practice. But then let's talk here, what are some of the challenges of owning a dental practice? Owning a circus, I mean practice, I mean circus. You being in charge, you having all the responsibility, you managing the team, you being, you Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willick is a great book to read. You are the owner. Everything that happens in that practice is your responsibility from clinical to business, to management, to leadership. One of the big shifts, golden nacho tip, number two, going from associate to practice owner, going from associate to practice owner, a huge shift is the amount of things you have to think about while you're doing dentistry. So you can be in your room doing an implant crown as an associate and a practice owner. As an associate, you're thinking, I finished this implant crown. I can go on Facebook and read dental nachos. I can listen to a podcast. I can go on my phone as a practice owner thinking, as soon as I finish this implant crown, I got to work on the payroll. I got to work on this. Somebody's fighting over paper towels. So when you're an associate, I could call that the aunt or uncle of the practice. You're there to protect the practice, make sure it's safe. But if the toilet breaks, not your problem. If the payroll doesn't pay your team, which has happened to us, and people can't pay their bills, which has happened to us, and you have to figure that out while you have to check two hygienists. So you have to be able to mentally shift gears, be much more mentally flexible, and answer a lot of questions. So what's the difference from going from associate to practice owner? Shifting gears mentally all the time, thinking about things outside of clinical dentistry, being mentally flexible, worrying about the quote unquote, toilet breaking, the payroll not being run, the supplies not coming, the server going down, ransomware, things that have me, you get texts in the morning. Whenever you get a morning text on your cell phone as a practice owner, not once has it been, hey, Paul, you're so handsome and funny. Can't wait to see you at the office. No, it's unfortunately my child's sick. I can't get into work. This happened. I can't go into work. So what do you do as an associate if the hygienist, I'm an awesome hygienist watching in, in with us who also works with me at Dental Nachos, she can't come to work. The associate's like, oh, guess they're not coming to work. The practice owner's like, we got to change all the patients. We got to do this. So it's important that you get golden nacho tip number three. Get as good as possible at your clinical dentistry before you become a practice owner. Know your systems. It doesn't mean you can't add in implant placement. It doesn't mean you can't add in sleep apnea. But becoming clinically competent, clinically comfortable, being able to troubleshoot. So if an implant crown doesn't fit for me as an owner, versus an associate, it's the same implant crown that doesn't fit, but I can troubleshoot with decision making. So decision fatigue, a concept you can Google, decision fatigue. Barry Polanski turned me on that, Dr. Barry Polanski. He wrote a great book. He's one of my friends. I uh, wrote a book, The Porch. I highly recommend you check it out. He's in practice for many years, went from PPO to fee-for-service practice owner. Decision fatigue is a real thing. So what are some challenges you're worried about? So that's enough talking from, from me. Uh, what are some challenges that you're worried about? You're here, you might wanna buy a practice. This is a back and forth. When you see my face go off, think of typing something in the chat. What are some challenges you're thinking about in buying a practice? How could I help you overcome these challenges? Feel better about these challenges. Insurance, team management, leadership, crying inside. What are some of these challenges? We have more people, we have more and more people rolling in here to this course. So we've gone over a few golden nacho tips. DSO Associates can earn a, high, a very high amount of income. So when you, if you're a DSO associate and you go to buy a practice, you may have to acknowledge or understand that you may make less money initially as a practice owner. Traditionally, private practice associates, when you've gone from associate to practice owner from private practice, you've earned more money. Being able to mentally switch gears, mental flexibility, answer questions as a practice owner, different than an associate. Golden nacho tip, associate is the aunt or uncle, practice owner is the parent. I'm an aunt or uncle of awesome, awesome nieces and nephews. They're my sister's children. If they're having a meltdown, I'm like, here, Jill, this is the one that you own. I have these two over here. So it happens to me even as a parent. 
aunt or uncle, get as clinically comfortable, golden nacho tip, get as clinically comfortable with your clinical dentistry before owning a practice. Learn how to troubleshoot. Learning how to troubleshoot doesn't mean there's no trouble. It just means you know how to get out of these jams. And sometimes the jam is sending the patient home and taking a press in the next day. Sometimes it is shifting gears and doing something different in that procedure. So we're gonna keep going on here with some more questions. So what is our checklist for success to create a framework for this challenge? Take a picture of this. This is everything, okay? Anyone see the show, This Is Us? I was watching it, but I didn't feel like crying on a Tuesday anymore, so I stopped watching it. It's a great show. So what is everything? Why do you want to buy a dental practice? Why do you want to buy a dental practice? How to get started? Work with brokers and find a practice. Where should you buy a practice? Who should be on your team to prepare, prepare and protect you? When should you connect with the bank? What helps you with success, prevents too much stress, and reduces crying inside? So let's go back to my story here for a minute. So the story of my mistake overpaying by at least $30,000 when buying a practice. In 2011, I overpaid for our second dental practice. This is our second. This was our first big problem. This is our satellite practice. Here are some of the reasons why this happened and what I would do differently now. I've owned this practice with my brother for the past decade, and there have been some really good parts about having this practice and some stressful parts. My goal in sharing this experience is to help you be a little more aware and prepared in making a huge life decision. Number one problem, the seller was represented by a dual representation broker. What this means is both the seller and the buyer, me, had to pay a commission to this broker. So golden nacho tip, dual representation brokerage is nacho nuts. I don't know how it's legal. I don't know how dentistry accepts it. I accepted it a decade ago. There was no dental nachos. There was no Mark Costas podcast. There was just me trying to figure things out. So when the dual representation broker said, I'm going to help you and the seller, I'm like, oh, that sounds pretty nice. Little did I know, this is one of the reasons why I overpaid $30,000. I'm going to use an example. Sorry to bring up basketball again, but I got a lot of basketball fans on here. Would it be normal if, if people said, my favorite team is the Lakers and also my favorite team is the Celtics? That would be odd. Very, very odd. My favorite team's the Sixers, also the Celtics. Very, very odd. My favorite team's the Sixers, also the Knicks. Very, very odd. That's a Rob Montgomery joke. So a dual representation broker claims to be able to represent both sides. We're going to go over a little more of that in a minute. So I would be very reluctant to work with a dual representation broker again as a buyer. And if I had to do it for some reason, I would have my transition team, especially my dental focused attorney, be extremely cautious about the claims made by the broker and the practice in the seller's mindset. Second big mistake I made was paying 70% of collections. We're going to talk over this challenge about how practices are valued. How, so how do we value practices? We're going to talk about how that's done because I work as a seller's broker. But a take-home tip, a golden nacho tip, is the value of a practice should be based on profit, not percentage of collections. See, this is how we learn short bits of information. This is how when you see people, if you made a cartoon of me and I was saying this, you should say, this is Dr. Paul Goodman, dentist and practice broker, someone who overpaid for a practice. What he's sharing with you, golden nacho tip is the value of a practice should be based on profit, not percentage of collections. So I paid 70% of collections. I should have paid based on profit. I didn't know any better at the time. Looking back to date now, and looking back now, if a more up-to-date practice valuation metrics were used, the purchase price should have only been 50% of total collections. What I would do now is have a dental-focused accountant analyze the true profit before I made an offer. So another golden nacho tip here is, if you cannot afford to pay the right advisors, I know this is tough, you're not ready to buy a practice. So if you cannot afford or don't want to, or are too dentist cheap to pay the right advisors, you're not ready to buy a practice. This is the biggest decision of your entire life, not your dental career. I sell practices with my awesome Nacho Transition team. We meet dentists at the end of their life. Right now, they're overwhelmingly male, few females, but there's gonna change to male and female. But these males that we meet in their 60s and 70s may have had multiple houses, multiple spouses, one practice. The practice they bought when they're 29 is the same practice they had when they're 69. It's an super, super, super big decision. The biggest decision of your life. So if you don't want to pay a dental focused accountant $2,500 to analyze the cash flow, just an example, could be more, could be less. If you don't want to pay $2,500 to analyze the true cash flow, you're not ready to buy a practice because you're going to burn your nachos, make a mistake if you don't get all the data that you need to survive, succeed, and thrive. So I would have had a dental focused accountant truly
Hey everybody, welcome to How to Find a Job in Dentistry Without Really Crying. We're gonna be interviewing the awesome Dr. Jordan Barnett soon. Enjoy this short three minute video on words not to say to patients if you wanna sound less weird and help patients move forward. Uh, we have some people uh, coming in, which is awesome. This show is about you. So if you have a question, a concern, a comment about finding a job or hiring an associate, we are here to answer that for you. Time is recording. I'm in full dad mode on a Sunday morning, but so glad to spend 30 minutes with you guys to deliver value, help support each other, help share more, deliver responsible information. This is one of the lectures I wish we had in dental school, how to find a job without really crying. But dental school was super focused on the Krebs cycle and memorizing how the kidney works. Two things that have helped me precisely zero times in private practice. So enjoy this short video on patient communication. And then we're going to bring up the amazing Dr. Jordan. Uh, please feel free to ask questions in the chat. There's also a gift here. So if you text gift to 215-543-6454, you can get a $143 Nacho CE gift code to get any CE on demand that you would like at Dental Nachos say words to you that make you feel weird, scared, and afraid. Well, it's not your dentist's fault because they went to dental school. And in dental school, we are taught to talk really, really weird. You may have a hygienist as well. She's also taught to talk really, really weird. My name is Dr. Paul Goodman, Dr. Nacho, and I am helping dentists and hygienists everywhere not talk weird. <laughs> So I've come up with five words you should not say in a dental office. Five words that will make your patients feel scared, feel weird, feel afraid, and make you unlikable. So what are these five words? So we're going to go through, don't say this, say this. The first word is fail or failed. There's no reason we have to look at a patient who's had a bridge in place for 20 years and say, Millie, your bridge has failed. It's unlikable, it's mean, and it doesn't even make sense because cars don't last that long. So instead of failed, how about we say this? Hey Millie, it's time to replace your bridge. So don't say fail, say replace. What's next? My personal favorite, the one that makes you feel so weird on the inside when you say it. If a tooth does not have a filling, we are taught to call those teeth virgins. Does that make you feel comfortable to hear the word virgin? Instead of saying virgin, how about saying tooth without a filling. This tooth doesn't have a filling, not that it's a virgin. The third thing is save. We often say to patients, we can't save this tooth. So dramatic, like it's private premolar Ryan and Tom Hanks is coming to save it. So instead of that say, hey, the cavity here has gotten so deep, we cannot maintain this tooth. So to review, don't say fail, say replace. Don't say virgin, say tooth without a filling. Don't say save, say maintain. We have two more. Informed consent, so dramatic. I'm gonna give you an informed consent for a root canal. Now, what could you call an informed consent? A heads up. I'm gonna give you a heads up what can happen. So you can have an informed consent form where it says informed consent, but as you bring it to life for patients, say, I'm gonna give you a heads up. Most of the time things go really, really well, but these are some things you should know about your procedure. I'm gonna give you a heads up, whether it's a root canal, scaling and root planing your crown. And the final one is the P word. Do not say this P word. And that P word is policy. No one likes to hear that word. You don't like it, I don't like it, and our patients don't like it. So you may have a financial policy where everyone pays before treatment. That's cool. But instead of saying policy, why don't you call it protocol? So don't say policy, say protocol. So these are the five words you should not say to be less weird and more likable in the dental office. Don't say fail, say replaced. Don't say virgin, say tooth without a filling. Don't say save, say maintained. Don't say informed consent, say heads up. Don't say policy, say protocol. If I can help you in any way, just reach out to me at dentalnachos.com. It is my life's goal to help you talk less weird. Give me some sort of like either a sign like this and I'll go. We are taught to talk really, really weird. Virgins, virgins, private premolar Ryan. Tom Hanks is coming to say really, really weird. Did 
So our show today is sponsored by Dennis Job Connect. I'm the founder of Dennis Job Connect. My amazing sister is the director of Dennis Job Connect, Jill. And this is a great story to start with. We just hired an awesome associate, Dr. Alicia, Dr. Alicia, using my own invention, Dennis Job Connect. We're so glad to have her at our office. It is the right fit for her. It's the right fit for us. She's with us two days a week right now. I did a 10-minute interview about how she found her two positions in dentistry, how they're different, what she's learning in the new real world of dentisting. She just completed her GPR. So how do you find an associate position? Use both. Use online and personal connections. Use connectors everywhere, specialists, attendings, instructors, equipment reps, dentist job connect, indeed, because you want to find the right fit for you. So I am ready to bring up the amazing Dr. Jordan. You can share your video whenever you would write. like. Hey, Jordan, how's it going all the way from Arizona? Good morning, <laughs> California, actually. California. Good morning from the West Coast, West Coast. How are you? Thanks for being here with us. I'm so impressed you got up at 4 a.m. I thought I got up early, so this wasn't too early for you, right? 4 a.m. is my usual, and uh, you don't have to be that nacho nuts uh, to be a successful associate to wake up that early. But yes, uh, um, my wife and I, we're, we're early risers. So yes, good morning. Never too early for Paul. Awesome. Well, our uh, goal today, and I'm so appreciate you being so amazing to share with us, is to help with the four major decisions and getting your first job buying your first practice, hiring your first associate, and selling your only practice. So we have people joining us here on Zoom. We're also streaming this to YouTube. This may be seen one day by hundreds of thousands of dentists, Jordan. So I'm so glad to have you with us. And this is really getting your first job and hiring your first associate are two sides to the same coin. So you put together some awesome information for us. I want to just share with everybody. If you text, if you're watching the show and you text in... Uh, job to 215-543-6454. You will see all of our open positions that we have right now on Dennis Job Connect. You can browse by state. You can apply. You can connect. You can learn about those there. So I'm going to stop sharing here, Jordan. And I have a few things to lead us as you're bringing your, your presentation up. So take your time in doing that. Absolutely. So I promised in promoting this show, we would talk about five ways to cry less inside when finding an associate position. Five ways to reduce stress, increase success and not cry inside. So I always make lists. The Checklist Manifesto is one of my favorite books. So I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to run through these. I'm going to talk about them in detail as we go through your presentation. But these are my five ways to cry less inside when finding your first associate position. ABC from day one of D1 in dental school. Always be connecting from day one of D1 in dental school. The process of finding your first job starts the day you enter dental school. The process of applying is usually six months from your entrance into the real world, whether graduating from dental school or uh, finishing your GPR AGD. Uh, don't ask this, but do ask this. Don't ask on the first interview about philosophy of occlusion. Don't ask on the first interview if you can buy into the practice. It's too much too soon, but do ask this, do ask this, do ask this. What is the expected production per month for this associate position? This seems like a really great position, Dr. Guac. What is the expected production per month? And listen for an answer because we're looking for a real answer. In, if I was asking myself this question for this position for our newest associate, I'd say two days a week is eight days a month. Our expected production is between $1,500 and $2,500 a day. It's a mentorship-based position. So if you're looking to make the most amount of money right now, it might not be the right fit for you. But if you're looking to be in an environment where you're going to learn about private practice, it would be. So Jordan, we have ABC from day one of D1. Don't ask about occlusion. Do ask about expected production. Um, a daily safety net guarantee, a daily safety net guarantee shows you that the practice is putting its money where its mouth is. This can be often controversial. It doesn't have to be, but I have hired eight plus dentists to work in our practice and they have gotten a daily safety net guarantee, NMW, no matter what, from their first day till the last day they left. This is including dental specialists. So a daily safety net guarantee, uh, which now is usually in the range of $500 to $700 a day is not called the most money you can make. But what it is called is a guarantee to be able to pay your rent, pay your loans and pay your food. So we talked about ABC, always be connecting day one of D1. We talked about ask, what is the expected production per month for this associate position? Now we talked about not having a daily safety net guarantee as a red flag to dig into. Explore the why is my fourth one, Jordan. Explore the why. Why is this 
office looking for an associate? Are they replacing an associate that left? Absolutely. That's a good sign because there's a list of patients for you. Are they really, 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 really busy? Okay. Busy is a feeling, not a fact. Busy is a feeling, not a fact. Dr. Phil said something feelings are not facts. So ask more. So explore the why. And finally, uh, two, this is 5A and 5B. Ask to speak with the previous associate and say this, hey, Dr. Jordan, you have this giant practice. You hire all these associates. I see you're replacing one because they went to Perio. That's awesome. This is a real story from my life. Would I be able to speak with Dr. Jill so I can make sure I'm the right fit for you so I can hear about the position from Dr. Jill? If the practice has a problem with that, it's a problem. If the practice has a problem with that, it's a problem. Whether they loved you, didn't like you, with you as the practice owner, as the group, if you say, nah, you can't talk to them, it seems weird. You may want to provide context. If I said, Dr. Sarah was awesome, but it took her three and a half hours to do a class one, and we couldn't do that in our practice. Maybe she's better in a different setting. That's context. And uh, my final one is the difference between observation, observation in a practice and a working interview. So we have all of our associates come and spend a full day with us to see if it's the right fit for them. So they see the energy while things are going on. They wear scrubs, they observe, they see everything. I do not have or have never had said, hey, Dr. Alicia, do you feel like doing a root canal today on someone you just met so we can test out your skills? So Dr. Jordan and I are friends, but just friends don't agree on everything. I'm married. Do you agree on everything with your wife? It doesn't mean I don't get <laughs> married. I stop being married, but I am not a supporter of a working interview. I am a huge supporter of an observation time. I am a supporter of a a period of time where you're working with your associate to make them successful. And in contracts now, it's become more popular to perhaps put in a clause for 90 days. Hey, Dr. Jordan, I'm going to hire you for 90 days. In this time, if for any reason you want to leave or we're not the right fit for you, restrictive covenant doesn't kick in. Okay. That That's may be fair. Yep. That may be a better way to test things out. We all took a driver's test. It's not necessarily a good indication of how good you are driving a snapshot. So if you guys want to remember my, my five tips, ABC from day one, always be connecting. Ask what the expected production is for this position. Don't ask about occlusion or if you can buy in on the first interview. Uh, daily safety net guarantee. Uh, not having one uh, can be a red flag. Explore the why. Ask to talk to the last associate. Uh, a working observation, not a working interview. And then finally, how could I forget about my favorite, Jordan? We've, when we're going to turn to you, watch out for spoiled guac PPO adjustments. So one of the things you want to ask as an associate is, oh, you take 47 insurances? That must mean that you got a lot of patients in. Would you share with me what kind of adjustments there are for these insurances? Because a crown can be $1,200. But if you're seeing the spoiled guac PPO ones, where all the crowns are adjusted down to $520, that can be a very difficult life for you. So Jordan, what do you think of my top five plus tips for not crying inside? I think that if dental nachos didn't exist, I would not be as happy or I would call it successful in my first year after, after dental school. So I think whatever Dr. Nacho says makes 100% truth. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, I just, I want to appreciate uh, or take the time to appreciate you, Paul. Thank you for everything Thanks, that you've done for me personally. And then for dentistry, just in the, uh, as a whole. And uh, yeah, you know, I think for you me, missed something biggest... though. You it's it's all a trick. You actually signed something that you're going to bring me liquid nachos in my old age home in five in five years. So you have to show up every day with liquid nachos for me to drink in payment. Sorry, it was it was in the contract. Paul, anything for you, Paul? Happy, <laughs> you know what? Hey, whatever they make up liquid nachos, I'll find those and I will I will ship those to you immediately. Um, yeah, on my iPhone 28, I'm sure I can just send it over automatically. But anyway. So yeah, good morning, everyone. Happy to have you all here. Set up for success though. So the reason why I'm turning this over to you, I'm going to stop my screen. A, you can check in the chat. I would love for you guys to ask questions to Dr. Jordan. He's living your life. I have spoken to a lot of dentists and dental societies and someone say, hey, Paul, do you want to talk to the young woman's dental society? And I said, you know, I'm a 40 year old man. And they go, well, you can try. And I said, not the way you want it to be because you want to see from people who are just ahead of you. If I want to buy five practices, I own two. I want to see someone who bought five practices in the last three years. So while my foundational tips are great, and I definitely can speak to this because I just hired a Dr. Jordan from step three, hiring an associate, I am bringing you the awesome Dr. Jordan. Ask questions in the chat. Jordan, I'll pop in every now and then, but I'm just going to turn it over to you. 
Awesome. Uh, yeah, thanks again, Paul. I appreciate it. And yeah, Paul's associate sounds like she is absolutely stellar. So congratulations, Paul, on an amazing associate. And congratulations to your associate for being an amazing mentor. Um, like Paul said, I just graduated last year during COVID, which is probably the most fun year to graduate. Um, and what I really put together for us is just a really quick um, PowerPoint to show you a visual representation of what this last year has been for me. Um, it has been quite a wild ride, as you can imagine, especially during COVID. And what I wanted to first talk on is the title of today's um, topic, which was how to find your first associate job without crying. Now, I think the first thing I want to do is talk about the title and combat that a little bit and think that in order to be in a position that you all are, if you're watching this and or if you are you know, a young dentist thinking about their first job, that should be a really exciting time. I understand there's tears in a lot of the things that we do as dentists. That's kind of the job that we picked, but this should be an exciting time because what you're doing now is you're actually looking for the place that you'll be able to live the dream of, I want to be a dentist, right? You didn't grow up thinking, I can't wait to be a dental student. I can't wait to be a dental resident. I can't wait to be a specialty resident. What you wanted to be is blank job, which is dentist, endodontist oral surgeon, periodontist, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And now what you're looking for is you're in an opportunity. Congratulations, by the way. You're looking for an opportunity to actually have that job and have that position. So I want to share a little bit about my story. And in my story, I get pretty explicit with the details in terms of compensation, in terms of the goods, the bads, and the uglies, because in this last year of experience, a little bit of all three. Um, so I wanted first start, and it says a review of my first year. I just, uh, I was so fortunate to do another um, show like this with Dr. Nacho a couple of weeks ago. I'd check that out if you guys haven't got to see that. So for me, uh, this first year, this is kind of an overview on the clinical experience that I've had, as well as some growth areas that I've seen. Um, again, I did go straight from UOP uh, Dental School, Arthur A. Degoni School of Dentistry in downtown San Francisco in 2020. And then now I live in Fresno, Clovis, California. So here's an overview of the amount of work that I've done. Uh, and this was really showing, especially relevant to our last show of GPR versus private practice. So here's roughly a breakdown of the numbers and things that I've done throughout all of the different practices that I've worked at uh, here in Fresno, Clovis. Um, and then here you can see the growth areas, things that I feel like I've gotten better at. Confidence is a huge one. Um, speed, schedule optimization, i.e. looking at a day, most office or most offices have a dental software that actually shows all the appointments as rectangles, like an Excel spreadsheet, understanding that Excel spreadsheet, understand where you, the associate can hop back and forth, help the owner, help the mentor, help the hygienist, things like that, as well as material knowledge, hundred percent, because as you'll see, I've been at quite a few places now, um, how to optimize each material. So not only is there familiarity with the materials, but how does this material work best in my doctor hands? And lastly, treatment planning, right? Especially when you're at multiple places and, or it's the real world and there's no mentor or teacher looking at it. It's just you and your mind. What is the best? And I suppose highest yield way. What do patients want? What makes the most sense for me? What makes the most sense for our practice? What makes the most sense for the patient? Cause that should be what it's about. So, like I said, I graduated last year, and that was June 14th is when I graduated. June 14th, 2020, what is a special day. That was on a Sunday, actually. And here, I went all the way until I was licensed, which was August 27th. So, I haven't even been licensed in the state of California for an entire year. So, I, got, I received my license from the state of California. You can Google me, um, 8-27-20. So this is what my week looked like in that time. Now, I want you all to pay attention to this word because again, and this is kind of the format we'll see for each of the different slides, right? Is that I was in fact unpaid. Why was I unpaid? I wasn't working as a dentist. This is a practice that I came back to the city where I grew up from. My high school was as maybe two miles away from this practice. And this was my only dentist my entire life. So the idea was he was looking to potentially sell. Now, he'd never had an associate in 25 years of practice. This was a new venture for him. It was a new venture for me, obviously. And so I told him, you know what? It's COVID. It's a really difficult time. COVID was 
arguably one of the hardest times financially in the dental marketplace. And so I said, you know what? I'm okay now, right? I can make it until I get my license. I'm not going to be doing any dentistry anyway. And so what I'm going to be spending my time on as your associate, and mind you, him and I had come to an agreement, you know, during my third year of dental school, UOP is a three-year program. It's the only three-year program. So my third year is equivalent to everyone else's fourth year. So midway through, right before COVID, we had an agreement. And again, in this time, I spent the time, he's only open Monday through Thursday, being in the practice, getting to know the staff, introducing myself to every single patient that I could, right? Also talking to with his specialist that he himself talked to, right? That he himself refers to, I would go shadow them, right? Well, so what I'm doing is I'm creating this familiarity with the new doctor in town, right? Or the new doctor at the practice. That way it would ease everyone's transition. Now, not everyone has this ability. And I will say that this is something that I'll get back to. I do have five quick tips, kind of like Paul had um, for the end. But if you're really, really not sure on where you want to practice or what you want to do, going home is so, so, so valuable. Why? Because when you move somewhere else and there's nothing wrong with that, and thank God for Dental Nachos and Job Connect, because if you're really not sure and you're nacho nuts about where you're going to practice, that's an amazing place to help find a practice. But for me, I said, okay, well, I'm from here. This is the community that I, my personal statement in dentistry talks about coming to an underserved community from where I, from which I'm from, which is here, right. And wanting to make a difference here. So that's, that's me living out what my personal statement said to dental school. So again, I went for this long unpaid. Now, how did you get by? How did you pay the bills? I have a small private uh, photography business that I do on the side and that's what I was doing. So just because you're a doctor now doesn't mean that the world needs to bow at your feet. You know, if you got to pay the bills, you got to pay the bills. And that's how I was able to pay the bills while also doing this on top of everything. So pretty shortly after that, um, I started and we, well, you'll see too, as I'll jump back, it says prelude, you'll see prelude season one and then season two. And I am midway in season two and I'll explain that as we go more. So here in season one, right? This is what you see. This was my schedule here. So Monday through Thursday, and then I did not work Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. So here, and what you'll notice too, is because there's a couple different jobs, because I've been, like I said, all the different, all the different jobs, and I've done all of them, the goods, the bads, the uglies, and I'm more than happy to share everything that I've done, good, bad, or ugly. So here, job one, this is the first job that I had as a dentist, my hours for patient care were eight to five. And then you saw administrative five to six thirty or seven. Now, remember, this is a place that I wanted to own, that there was an understanding that I would take this practice over. How am I going to learn all of the dentistry while also learning all of the business side, while also learning how to manage a staff, while also learning, you know, all the legalities of dentistry? Because believe me, there's a hefty amount. And then plus, like Dr. Goodman said, uh, spoiled guacamole PPO, learning insurance. This is a heavy PPO, I'd say 95% PPO practice. So how you wrap your head around all of those things at once. Well, for me, I found my time in doing that um, after patient care. So I would catch up on notes. I would normally look at x-rays for the next day, right? I would do the things that I thought I needed to do in order to be one competent, for my patients, because again, you're brand new, you're probably never going to feel competent. Second, I wanted to learn, okay, this is how I was going to plan my day. These are the material choices that I would use. This is, you know, this is kind of a rough idea of what I wanted to do or what I wanted to accomplish the next day. This is how I could use my time the best, things like that. And then also talk, you know, I would also talk with staff after hours if they were willing and, you know, they would be paid for that and say, hey, you know, what are things that we can do better? What are things that I can do better? How can I help right, our practice better? Remember, I, if you're an associate, you are an employee. Now, I understand there's a difference between W-2 and 1099. I've been both. And again, we can share a little bit more about that later. Um, but nonetheless, I am an associate here at a practice. And wherever I associate with, I want that to be a successful business because it is a business to make money, right? And the thing is, is when it comes to associates and the desire or non-desire to own, if you are an associate, right? If you close your eyes and pretended that you were the practice owner, who do you want more? Do you want an associate who's going to treat that business like it's their business? 
Again, there's an understanding that it isn't the associate's business. Nonetheless, taking responsibility of the practice and wanting the practice to, to do well versus your own success, that is a huge biggest tip number one. And again, we'll go over these later, but making sure that the practice is successful, not just you being successful. So, and as you can see right here, I was a brand new graduate and what we agreed to was $550 a day. So that was a per diem. So whether I did $0 in production or whether I did $10,000, I never did 10,000, but whatever I produced that day or collected on whatever, it was $550 a day. It was a very clean calculation. And whenever it comes to compensation, that's an incredibly important thing. The most important thing is, is if you are a licensed dentist or dental specialist, I expect you to be astute enough, especially with finance, whether it was paid for for school. That's amazing. Congratulations. Thank whoever paid for it. And or if you're like me who borrowed maximum loans. I expect you to be able to do the mathematics for yourself to understand how much money you need to make every single day. That's a really good way of discussing compensation with a potential boss or owner is say, look, I want to work. I think daily guarantees are great. You'll see I have a lot of daily guarantees, which I'll go over in the next couple of slides, but I need to make this much money. I love this practice. I love working here, but if I don't make this much, I will not pay my bills. If I can make X amount and you can calculate that number, right? That's a number that you have privately in your head. You say, if I can make $400 a day, just, I want to interrupt ahead. to reinforce, um, I have a good tip for people in relationships, whether it's spouse, spouse, ones, brothers, or your team. I'm not interrupting. I'm interjecting to reinforce. One of the things that Jordan's doing so amazingly well is reverse engineering what he needs to survive. So many, we have, we have over 100 positions on Dennis Job Connect right now. And you have to have empathy for practice owners that are 50 who have been out of this game for a while. And they're just don't know the reality 100%. of what you're facing. So many times we'll say, will you provide a daily guarantee? And they say, no. And I say, well, that's going to be a problem. They say, well, it's a normal daily guarantee. I say, well, let's talk about $600 a day. They say, okay, that sounds good. So sometimes being able to just share your side and say, hey, I really want to work with you. I want to learn. But if I cannot earn at least $120,000 a year, I will not be able to survive. And if a practice owner doesn't care about that, it's not going to be a good fit. So really give you, compliment you, Jordan, for reverse engineering and using numbers, which Dennis loved, two or three on the Perio Probe, your favorite thing. They Is do. that a three or they a do. four, right? It, it's 2.5. Stop saying that. Nobody can see 0.5 on the on the Perio Probe yet. So just wanted to reinforce how valuable that is to reverse engineer your survival number. 100%. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. And it's it's a huge tip because again, I think it's important. I think it's all too often that graduates of dental dental school or residencies, they come out and they say, oh my God, I just need a job. Can I find a job? Yes, you can always find a job. And we'll talk more about that, obviously. But you need to make sure that you are compensated at a rate that you can live. You need to be able to live. For me, I was coming home and I live with, oh, she was my fiance at the time, now my wife, right? Very happy. Um, and we determined that this was the amount of money that I need to make this every day right now, 550 was a little above that. And of course, you know, as an associate, you would like to make as much as you possibly can. This was a number. And especially remember that I had already spent months in the practice prior to me actually being compensated. That was a number that I knew that the practice could easily survive off of because my owner was very open with me sharing numbers. And that's another point that Paul mentioned about the owner sharing things. Now, if you are a incoming dentist, you meaning you have the ability to affect treatment, which affects patients lives. And you are now coming into a position where you're looking to treat said patients. If an owner is unwilling to share certain figures with you for your success, you don't need to know everything. You don't need to know their monthly expenditures outside of work, but there are many things that that it is important for you as an associate to know. And if they're unwilling to share things that you need to be successful, that does not create a good recipe for your success. So again, season one from August 31st, that was the Monday after I got my license to right up to Halloween. This is what it looked like from Monday through Thursday. And then Friday here I had off. So I spent that time shadowing. I did a lot of spear. I did sign up for spear, which was great for me um, reading business books. And then I don't have on there, but 
I would read dental nachos probably like an hour or two a day. Uh, there's just so much quality content on there and good dentists who really care and want to share the best stuff. Um, so I would read that as well. Now here, what I noticed in this first job is that, man, I'm only, you know, this, this owner, right. He's a great guy, but he has kind of a lot of older materials. He is super busy and does he love dentistry? I don't know if he loves dentistry and I really need more mentorship. Someone who wants to show me the actual clinical dentistry side. So what I did was ABC always be connecting. I got my second job here. My second job is someone just to show how you never know what's going to happen. When I was a second year in dental school, which was again, UOP is a three year. So I was in the clinic and I was on a radiology rotation and I literally had done all of my things, right. That I need to do. I had to take X amount of FMXs. And so because I did more of them than all of my other cohort that was on the rotation with me, they said, you cannot do anything right now. Your classmates have to catch up. So I was sitting in a room, a dark radiology room saying, this sucks. I'm going to start looking at my career and what I want to do. So this guy here, his name is Chris Shamley and I work with him currently. He's amazing. So I actually went on my local dental system because I knew I wanted to come back to Fresno. I went to the Fresno Madera Dental Society website, looked at the classified ads. This guy here, Chris, Chris Shamley, he had an ad out that said, looking for an associate, want to be a mentor. So looking for someone who wants mentorship. I called him from school, even though I was 18 months out from graduation. I said, hello. I said, hey, I just want to let you know, my name is Jordan Barnett. I'm a second year dental student. I'm from Fresno Clovis, which is you. He practices. His office is six miles away from the house I grew up in. I said, I loved your post. I'm nowhere near there yet, but I just want to, you know, I want to introduce myself and I would love to, you know, meet you and just talk and get your advice or opinion on a couple of things. Him and I shared more and more and more and more and more. And he did offer me a position when I was still in dental school. Again, because I thought that I was buying job number one, I said, you know what? I really appreciate it, doc. But, you know, unfortunately, you know, there's a practice that I have a potential for, you know, ownership, which is what I want to do. And I said, you know, I, I'm going to, I'm going to have to say no, but here's the thing. You know, I have a bunch of classmates that are looking for a job. Maybe I can help you connect. Great. So in August or er, in June, when we graduated, I actually was helping one of my classmates and he and her, right. were looking for the potential to work together. It didn't work out because my classmate found an uh, opportunity closer to where she was from. And she took that, but him and I stayed in touch. We went to coffee every so often. And I finally called him. I said, you know what, Dr. Shamlin, I really love our relationship that we've had. I think I would love to work with you maybe in capacity. I'm available on Fridays and the weekends. How does that work for you? He said that works awesome because I, my practice is open Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And on Friday, we're open 1 30 to 6 30. I know those are weird hours, but this is a crucial time because his positioning of his practice is open when we're the only dental office open on Fridays at that time in like a five or 10 mile radius. And believe me, I have pulled a lot of teeth or done a lot of pulpal derivements at 5 30, 6 30. And it is amazing. And what is, is he was able to show me, he mentors me really well. The first four weeks that I worked for him, I didn't even see a patient. He said, just shadow me. I just want you to ask any questions that you have and we can discuss every case, case by case. So this was like school, but I was being paid for. I was essentially shadowing for $50 an hour plus 10% of whatever collection it was. That's what we agreed to. I said, that's awesome because the money that I was making here, right? Monday through Thursday, that was able to pay my bills. This was an added thing. This was like a paid CE is how I saw it. And it was phenomenal. So here season one now from November 2nd to January 1st in the year, we we're working job one Monday through Thursday. And then Fridays we were working, uh, for five hours, 1 30 to 6 30 PM. And it was tremendous. And I loved it. Now we moved on to the, to the new year, 2021. And again, job one, right. I was starting to definitely pick up some speed. I was really starting to produce. And these are things that as an associate, I want to show that I'm being successful. How am I showing that I'm being successful? My production shows that I'm being successful. I'm coming in on time. I'm having good patient outcomes. Patients are happy. Patients are leaving reviews. Patients are telling the owner, Hey, I really like this guy. He's great. Right. These are the types of 
clinical outcomes that you want to show. So after doing that, and again, this is a job that I was looking to own, right? I worked, I convinced the owner, I said, okay, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And then also I want to add a Saturday that I would work eight to two. I will only do it if I'm able to do my per diem, right? And with that per diem, I want to work solo because believe me, he said, my owner said at the time from job one said, I will not be here on Saturday. That's fine. This is a way for me to prove to myself that I can run a very small team because we had a very condensed staff. It was only one hygienist and myself, and I had two associates to myself. And then one of my, uh, or excuse me, one, two assistants to myself and one of my assistants, uh, I actually made like the office manager. I called him the weekend office manager. Um, so that's what it was. It was five of us and we worked together on Saturdays. Was it glamorous? No. Was $550 a day, was that a lot of money? No. Relative to what other dentists make? No. Relative to my first job picking watermelon on a farm where I made $8 an hour? Yes. So remember, everything's perspective. And again, these are the numbers and calculations that made sense to me and my fiance when I was working. So that's what it looked like. This was my week from, you know, for the first two months or for the first two months of this year. Now, not everything goes as planned. Like I said, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, you know, during that second wave of COVID, which was January, February, especially in my town, um, we really started to see a slowing of patients coming in, or we had a large increase of cancellations. I remember at one point I was tracking that on average on the job one, we were getting four. Hey guys, we lost Jordan there for a second, so he'll probably come back and see us. I think we're getting so many people watching in, so I would love if you guys asked a few questions, but while we're waiting for Jordan, a couple things to share with you. Being a dentist, the goal is to reduce the number of times you feel like crying inside a day and feel better about what you do. Develop your dentist and core, your mind skills, your word skills, and your hand skills. So we have an amazing offer for you. Text GIFT to 215-543-6454. If you do that, you will get a $143 Nacho CE gift code, 143 in honor of one of my heroes, Mr. Rogers. 143 stands for I love you. So uh, you text that in, you get it, and then you can use it to get a pass to Super Dennis Boost, which is $8, only $8. You can buy other stuff too. It is next week. We're going to learn clinical skills, business skills, leadership skills. You're going to hear from dentists at every age and stage of their life. Super Dentist Boost is going to be truly amazing. We have dentists traveling from all over the country to be in studio with us. And then we're going to have, we have up to all, close to 1,000 dentists and humans registered on the live stream. But thanks to the spacious seating of the internet, we can have 10,000. We can have 100,000. Watch in on it like pay-per-view CE that you can get for free by texting GIFT to 215-543-6454. I've worked so hard over the past three years with my amazing team to put together a platform where you can learn anytime, anywhere. We have courses on business, clinical, practice management, finding a job, buying a practice and more. I see Jill is on here with us, uh, Dennis Job Connect Director. And she uh, is the person who makes all these magical connections happen. She works so hard for this. So if you have any questions, you can reach out to her. Jordan, I was just doing this perfect. It was time for a commercial break. Don't perfect. cry inside. By developing your dentist and core, if you text GIFT to 215-543-6454, you get a gift code to get Dental Nacho CE. So now I'm glad to take it back to you whenever you're ready, but I'm also ready to fill time. I am going to tell you, Jordan, you are amazing. One day you may have your own moderators running around your house. Maybe yes, maybe no, but I'm going to set um, a finish line. Here's a talking tip for everyone. It's a pretty good one. Definitely. I learned it at a podcast. Not all my top talking tips come from my head. A lot do. Like, don't say virgin. Don't call teeth virgins. It's very weird. Just say tooth without a filling. You want to make some 75-year-old woman, Millie, feel weird on a Tuesday at 10.30 a.m.? Just start shouting virgin at her. It's a 30-year-old. It's a weird feeling. So this talking tip didn't come from me, but words have so much energy. Like, don't say fail. Say replace and ready to retire. Don't say hopeless prognosis. Say not a good chance of working out. So I'm going to say this to Jordan because he's so enthusiastic and well as we're going to set a finish line of about 15 more minutes of sharing. We'll take Perfect. a few questions and then we can always have, like, I'm here in Philadelphia. You're going to come visit me. Yeah. One, two, three, and four. So we, whatever you don't get to, just make a notation and we'll do it on segment two. So anyone who has questions for Jordan, we have more people coming in or me, please put them in the chat. I'm going to let Jordan share for 15 more minutes. When you see me pop on, it'll be Q&A time. Thanks, Jordan.
Perfect. Thank you so much, Paul. Yeah. And that should be That's more than enough time. And sorry about that. My computer actually sure. died. And how funny is that? Because I was just explaining how this went on. And unfortunately, we were really getting hurt um, by COVID and the second wave. And so um, things were really slowing up at job one. And we were seeing ever so slightly that um, personalities didn't really match from job one. Uh, again, this is the practice I was looking to own. And so um, unfortunately, we both reached an agreement where we said, you know what, I don't think this is working out very well. Um, again, for me, I, I want everyone to understand that, you know, I'm no better than anyone else. Um, and I'm not saying this to show how morally virtuous I was or things like this, but again, $550 a day, there were some days where I would come in and there was maybe I had three patients and all of them canceled. And I would go to the owner and say, you know what? It doesn't make sense for the practice to pay me today. There's nothing for me to do. So either I'll take your schedule and, or I'll just head out of here and you don't have to pay me. And that did happen, you know, quite a few times. Um, I would say maybe five, six times where I would do a half day and make half, you know, the, the daily guarantee. And I said, you know what, I can't financially afford to do this anymore. And again, for him, I don't think things were trending in the way that he wanted them to. So I said, okay, that's fine. Well, you know, I have to, you know, take care of myself. Um, and I am going to, you know, start looking on. He said, yeah, you know what, that'd be a good idea. See if you can get a job, you know, other days of the week, and maybe you can work uh, only a few days. I did do some working interviews and I, I think Paul got it, said a good point uh, about working interviews. I think observations are a good idea. Working interviews, even though some of them were successful for me, they're often train wrecks and they don't, they're not fair to patients. I do agree with Paul's point there. Um, and so I did take some and then I was able to find um, some really good positions. So what I did was we got to a point and I'll reach ahead with job one. And I said, you know what? Um, I made the decision to leave. And so here I knew I had a big trip coming up. Um, my uncle got married. It was a destination wedding in Hawaii in April. How does a dentist, how can they take off a whole week? Well, what I did was again, I, I, uh, actually quit that job. And so job two here, I actually added the Wednesday cause I said it's open Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. So now I worked job two, right? Same thing here with the $50 an hour. Okay. I'd been there now for, I'd say, you know, what was it? Um, from November to March, this has been four months, right? He actually wanted me to do the Mondays too. I was like, you know what? I want to see what else I can, I can do. And so here I work job two now and here. So I went from working six days a week down to a day and a half in a week. So is everyone able to do that? No. It should everyone do that? No. But I was confident in myself. I was confident in the experience that I got. Because at this point now, I was able to show actual data, right, without sharing patient information, but I could show that on a PPO schedule, I could produce $2,500 to $3,000 a day. I worked with a staff, which was, you know, kind of bare bones because that's really everyone in dentistry during COVID, right? Dental assistants, they said it was the number one largest gap in terms of all jobs, in terms of available positions to people that are actually working in it. So yeah, it was, uh, it was, I, I was able to show that, Hey, I can do this and this is what I can come and provide for. And so this is what my week looked like. Didn't work Monday. Didn't work Tuesday. I would schedule all my working interviews on Thursdays and I worked the Wednesday, Friday. Um, and then I went on a vacation, like I said, uh, pretty much that last week of April. Now, this was a very successful and fruitful time for me. I think as dentists, we don't always get a break. Um, I definitely was really kind of um, spinning my wheels at this point, getting great experience, loving doing dentistry, but that break was nice. And then we were able to go on a vacation and this is where things got a little bit crazy. We started season two and this is where things got really fun. So here, this is what my current schedule looks like. And I have one more slide, which is no different, but there was changes in compensation. So I was able to secure a third job, which was Mondays and Tuesdays. This is at a DSO office right by my house. Okay. I still kept the Wednesday job. That's the Wednesday, Friday, previous slide. So I'm still here. Right. And then now I got a fourth job and this fourth job is here eight to five. 
as well as Friday, I would do the mornings by myself. So this is, oh, it's not eight to five. This is eight to one, excuse me, right? And so on my Fridays, and this is my typical working Friday, I work this job here, right? And then I immediately go, I finish my last patient at one. And then I start with my first patient at one 30 here at my next job. And that's just enough time for me to drive over there comfortably, safely, and uh, get there and start going again. Now, is this something that I can do all the time? No. Can I do this forever? No. But again, for me, I saw it as a mountain of competence and I wanted to take maybe not the steepest route, but a route where I had mentors that all help me. Cause I can tell you that this boss this boss and this boss I talk to every single day. They are always looking for things that I can improve on. I am constantly asking for their feedback to which they do not hold back on feedback. If it's good, they'll tell me. And if it's bad, they'll definitely tell me why I'm working as an associate at their office that they feed their family from, as well as feeding all the families of all of our staff and employees. I think it's easy for us as associates to think just about ourselves, but every practice, every business that you work at, anyone that works there is dependent upon the money that is made there. That is all come, it all comes to a head on whoever the owner is. So there's a lot of stresses and factors that I think we often miss that owners have to deal with. So um, just a thing to look out for. So lastly, here you'll see this job five. Well, job two my mentor, he's 37 years old. He just received his FAGD, uh, the Fellowship of the Academy of General Dentistry. His father owns a fee-for-service practice two miles away from this office, and they do emergencies. So here, I do do emergencies as well. So this is what that looks like here. Just to give you an idea, this last Friday, which was August 6th, I worked job four. I saw, I think, eight patients. I worked job two, slower day. We only saw a couple. And then because it was a slower day, my last patient ended at 530. There was a emergency extraction that I did at job five. All three of these practices are four miles away from each other. And we were able to do it. Again, is that the dream thing that everyone loves to do? Maybe, maybe not. But this is what I found for myself. Now we can talk about non-competes. We can talk about all the logistics all later. Um, for me, this is just kind of showing this is what's available. This is what's possible. If you, the associate are willing to do that. And so lastly, I don't know if you noticed on this last slide. So here I did get a 10% uh, raise here. So now this is $55 an hour and then still the 10% of collection. And then I did add a spear study club, which I do. This is um, the first Thursday I've ever and there is what I am paying to be in that. Um, and so lastly, um, you'll see here on job four, there was an increase here in uh, wage, right? You can go back to the previous slide to see what that was. And now it's that and or production, which is there. And so that just brings us to that last point. Paul, did you want to jump in real quick, ask a question? No, no, you grab up. We have a couple of good questions and a nice compliment for you from Dr. Amen, who's in the uh uh, audience here. So uh, you can yeah, wrap us up and we'll spend about 10 minutes answering some questions. Perfect. And then I just added this last slide because this is maybe the most likes I'll ever get on a social media thing ever. But this was on Dental Nachos. And the reason why I shared it is because this deeply resonated with dentists that were bads, beginning age dentists, rads, retired age dentists, right? Gads, golden age dentists, and mads, medium age dentists. Why? Because I think this shows that a lot of dentists would agree with this. And this is what I want to show now that I've shown the places that I've worked. So my 10 biggest tips are, yeah, mentorship is a must. Make sure, especially if you're a younger associate, make sure you're with someone who wants to actually help you and just tell you the different feedback. Paul has a great line that he always says, there's a difference between constructive feedback, right? And giving me feedback about work that I did versus now you're just attacking me as a person right? That mentorship is everything. And if you're a dentist and you're working at someone else's practice, and if you are closed to that feedback, there's a problem with you as the associate, not with the owner. Break down the, Except, break down the argument, not the person. Break down the procedure, not the person. Uh, so my mentor is Jordan's situation, behavior, impact. Let's just use an example of something like this. Because you work so hard on getting this contact so perfect, your next two patients are now in the waiting room waiting. So there might be an opportunity for you to identify 
when the contest is, is acceptable before moving on. Because I know dental school sometimes taught us to strive for perfection, but that sometimes can ruin your day in private practice if no one really cares about it. This is not saying don't be clinically acceptable. In the beginning of my, mm-hmm. I wish she was, she was um, listening. In 2017, when I had an associate at our, our second practice, uh, they were, the patients were saying, why is she taking so much longer than Dr. Paul and Jeff? And I jokingly said, I think she might be trying to do a better job than us. So I kind of put them in their place, right? But then I sure. said to her, I, this was a really good, this is just a good story. My amazing associate said, uh, I don't know if I can get all these cleanings done in 60 minutes because I got to meet the patient. I got to do the x-rays. I got to do this, just clean. I said, okay, tell me this. If we give you 90 minutes, are you okay being paid only 60% as much? She said, no, I'm not okay. I said, if we Mm -hmm. forced you to do it in 30 minutes so you could be paid twice as much, would that be comfortable? She said, no, because I wouldn't be able to do a good job. I said, well, how can we help you do a good job in 60 minutes? I think we can do it together. So that's just an example of breaking down the behavior, not the individual. And that's an amazing point because again, if you're an associate and you're close to that type of feedback, those are things that you're not thinking about that an owner can see from an ownership perspective. Because again, does the patient want to be there that long? Probably not. And if you're taking forever and now your entire staff has to wait longer, I had one Paul to where my owner was like, Hey, I hope you know that that assistant that just helped you, she had to pick up her two kids and they were late because you went too long. So it's always about identifying and decision trees. Is this clinically acceptable or not? Is it time to take a pause and not take an impression or not do that next extraction? Um, Your hair looks awesome, Jordan. I have my hat on for dad wear today, but I always say this and I start my lectures with this and I say, here's how we're going to get started. When you go to get your haircut, do you want the best haircut possible? Do you want your stylist to think they're going to do the best job they possibly can. They're going to do fee for service level. Everyone goes, yes, 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 yes. I say, is it okay? Keep your hand up if it takes seven hours. Nope. Well, now that's, yeah. let's get started. Let's figure out how we can do a great haircut in an accept amount of time, because we've all been at a restaurant where the chef is dotting the spaghetti, the pasta tea, and we're just hungry. So awesome, Jordan, you can stop share. I want to bring up one thing. I Perfect. want to give you a compliment. Dr. Eamon Buss, uh, practice owners retiring at the end of this year uh, in Lehigh. He's looking for a practice uh, associate in his practice in Lehigh Valley, PA. Uh, I believe he's one of our Job Connect clients or will be. So you can reach out to us, text job to 215-543-6454. He also, so this is what, this is everything to me. This is ABC, always be connecting and caring. So this Dennis says, this uh, Dr. AB says he's um, retiring at the end of this year. Okay. So he's lived a gad life, right? And he said to you, Jordan, and just this, you should just feel great about this. This is a very good presentation that you can show to associates how to plan for your future and be open to opportunities. So this is the lecture I wish we had in dental school. This is the content I wish they found time to get in because it's for survival. How the kidney functions, you can Google. The medication you're going to prescribe for a viral ulcer, you have assets to do it. Memorizing that information is likely a waste of brain space because when you need it eight years later, you're going to have to confirm it. But when you're sitting at an interview and someone says, I want to hire you, you're my first associate, we're really busy, I want your to say, Jordan and Paul said that might be something you have to ask more questions about because there's associates right now that are regretting the position they took by not listening to this stuff. So awesome, Dr. Jordan. Let me set you up with a couple of questions in our last 10 minutes. How can you have the energy to shadow when you're looking for work? Does shadowing become a different experience after the third year of dental school? So I think that's a great question. Uh, to me, I can tell you what, I love dentistry. So yeah, I totally have the energy always, but it's a great question. You're saying, does shadowing become a different experience? It should be. So if you've never been a dentist before, and now you actually are shadowing with the understanding of the materials of what the procedure actually is, what it was for me was me saying, okay, when I'm shadowing, I'm looking at the bite wing without the dentist telling me anything. I'm saying, this is what I'm seeing. This is the materials. I'm looking at the tray. These are the materials that he's using. This is how I would use them. And then while you're sitting there, you're watching how they're actually using it. Did they do something different than you? Did they do something the way that you would do it? And it depends. Some people, when they shadow, they don't want you to talk. And some people, they encourage you to ask questions or they'll teach. Wherever you are with that experience, right? Make sure that you understand that because again, you don't want to mess up their workflow or make a worse um, experience for the patient. But if they're allowing you to shadow, then hopefully there is that time, especially before you end, say, hey, doc, you know, I noticed that you used X X material and X procedure. Uh, Can you explain a little bit more why you did use that material choice over this material choice? I know we learned about X, Y, Z. This is what I thought about that. And uh, 
yeah, so it became awesome a answer. Huge, I, really and, different and one of the things I can share, things I wish I did more of in my life. I would say I wish I did more stretching when I was an athlete as a high schooler because I am not that flexible right now. Doesn't mean I'm not in shape, but what I encourage you to do is learn from people past you. Find the time to make these connections because they're going to be much more critical to your success than your grade on biochemistry. And I know that this is a balance and I know it's tough. I'm not saying fail any practicals, but what I'm saying is when there's opportunities to do real world things, ask dentists who are a few years out how they wish they did more of this, how they went, they went to more in-person study clubs, visit more labs. Next one, Jordan, wonderful presentation, very informative. What can you recommend for international graduates who are just trying to get into the two-year advanced standing program, but want to prepare ahead of time? How did your mentor relationship work? So maybe you're repeating a few things that you did, but this awesome person uh, said, uh, if they're waiting to get in, what could they do to network and get some mentorship? A, B, C, always be connecting. What does that mean? Go on LinkedIn, create a nice LinkedIn profile and put who you are and what you did. And it's basically an online resume and then start Googling the schools that you're interested in for whatever program from there, you're going to find many different professionals or people who work there. That's a LinkedIn thing. And then you can start reaching out and say, hi, I'm uh, Dr. Jordan. I'm an international uh, dentist, but I'm looking to get into um, certain positions would love to hear more about it. I guarantee there's lots of international dentists or internationally trained dentists on dental nachos. I bet we can find someone on there in the 30,000 plus. And, and secondly, oh, oh, how John, did the hold your ahead. second one for a second, Jordan? What Jordan says is mentorship and connections a two way street. Go on dental nachos or the business of dentistry or Facebook group and make five comments every day, not comments about you, comments about. Thanks for sharing this post. I never thought about it this way. Man, my favorite show is Shit's Creek. Thanks for having this post. Because when you connect to a community, you can't, people say to me all the time, hey, Paul, can I post that I need a job in San Francisco right now? And I've never seen them post once and I've never seen them comment. And I know it comes from a good place. And if they post, I need a job in San Francisco or a dentist, no one will see it because they're not engaged community members. So what you guys have with the power of your phone is the ability to ABC at any time. And you don't have to post a case that's not going well. You don't have to post, you want to quit dental school. You can just simply be a community member, JBY, just be yourself. And if you do that, you will become known in the Facebook communities as someone who shares. And then when it's time to ask for a mentor or ask to be connected, people say, oh, that's someone who adds value. That's someone who adds humor. Too often, people are only asking about them, A-A-Y, all about you. So it, I don't know, Jordan, if you see this it, with any generation, any generation, but that's just a, a not your ordinary tip. Make five comments a day in the business of dentistry and dental nachos as examples, comments, not posts, every single day for a year. And you will see how many people start interacting with you. You will explode. I can tell you that for sure. So yeah, huge tip. Definitely. Um, and then uh, the second question was a mentorship uh, relationship. I can tell you that if you are enough to want to be Nacho Nuts and be Dr. Nacho or a version of Dr. your own Dr. Nacho, that means that whoever the mentor that you're working with, especially if you hold a stake in their business to make them money, I only makes sense to me that they would want to help you with it. But again, there's two, there's the, it's a two way street. You as the associate need to be open to getting feedback. And believe me, I, whoever I work with, I don't want to say I hound them, but I'm always like, Hey, what did you think about this? what did you think about my timing? Hey doc, can I show you an x-ray? Hey doc, what are your thoughts on this? Hey doc, I noticed you use this material, but I'm using more of this material. Why are you using that material over this material? Any question you have if you feel like you're not getting that back and or you're scoffed at and or no one wants to help you, well, that doesn't really, that's not a very fruitful position for you. Because it's again, we talk all of you for you to make Jordan in that ask successful people or even just people who are ahead of you. What would you do different if you were in my shoes today, my dance go clogs, my fig scrubs today, and just say, it doesn't mean just because someone would do something different doesn't mean they hate their life. They might say, I wish I bought a practice later. I was so into practice ownership. And what I realized was once I bought that practice, I couldn't unbuy it. And you know what? I realized life is long and it's tied me down to an area and it made me geographically inflexible. And even though I like my life, and even though I'm glad I did, I would buy a practice later. 
Or someone might have waited 15 years and said they'd buy a practice sooner. Ask good questions. Um, we'll wrap Always. up this one, Jordan. Jobs three and four, did you find those via networking or something else? Both jobs three and four. Uh, I Again, so every day when I was looking for jobs, I would check on the Fresno Madera Dental Society. So that's my local chapter of the CDA. Um, I would also go on Craigslist. I'd also go on LinkedIn. Both of those jobs had a posting, but I was also taking uh, on those of which I called the front office. I always call the front office, right? Just to see how friendly they are over the phone. Because if I want to know what the experience that the patients are getting, right? Because if the patients aren't happy at the beginning, then how are they going to be happy to see me? So I would call them and say, hi, I'm Dr. Barnett. I noticed that Dr. Goodman had a nice post for a job opportunity. I'm highly interested and I would love to send him my online portfolio. If there's another video that Dr. Paul and I did that maybe we can link Dr. Paul where I discuss an online portfolio and all the logistics of it. And well, you, I'm always you're, happy you're, you're part of our YouTube collection uh, there. And this was just totally amazing. I want to thank you. Guac gratitude you, for taking the time to do this. What we're going to do now is we'll be great. The end of every presentation, before you get on with your Sunday, go work out, go do stuff. If you would take the time to just drop one comment in the chat of something you learned during this presentation, it would help Dr. Jordan, it would help me. And during that time, I'm going to tell you five words never to say to patients. So do not say these five words to patients unless you want to be very weird, unless you want to be unlikable. And you can text GIFT to 215-543-6454 to get a free CE gift. Our Job Connect program, if you text JOB to that same number, 215-543-6454, you'll see over 100 open positions. Two of our positions co compensate dentists over $300,000 a year. Doesn't mean they're the best positions, just means that there's opportunities for financial success if that fits you and you're geographically flexible. Thanks so much, Jordan. I'll let you stop your video. You're just awesome. Thank you. You know what? I'll just say one last thing. Like sure. what I hope, what I hope that this did for everyone is just show how creative you as the associate can get with your career. Remember, a, there's a difference between job and career. And for me, I want to be the happiest dentist that I can be. If I'm at a place that I'm happy at, I don't think that that's a good result for anyone. So anyone who has any questions, you can find me on Dental Notches. I'm pretty active on there uh, per what Paul, the tippy gave us. So happy to help anyone. Thank you, Paul, for everything. And uh, salute to Dental Nachos. I look forward to all the posts this next week. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Jordan. Appreciate it. People have asked Thank about you. the recording. I love giving you guys content to walk around and watch. I am going to text this out. It's on our YouTube channel, but our text platform is the best way to stay connected with us. Just text GIFT to 215-543-6454. Then you will get our text at any time. And I will text this out to our community, likely tomorrow, that Jordan, Dr. Jordan shared so much amazing value. And whether you're a beginning age dentist, medium age dentist, or about to finish your career, or a dental student, or someone in the business dentistry, you want to watch this. So that is the best way to get the recording. Enjoy these three tips. And I would love to hear your guys, what you guys learned in the chat. That would mean so much to me. If you would help me by sharing what you learned in the chat, 10 words or less, what you're going to take with you. Uh, we can create a better dentisting world where we care more, support each other, share more together. Say words to you that make you feel weird, scared, and afraid. Well, it's not your dentist's fault because they went to dental school. And in dental school, we are taught to talk really, really weird. You may have a hygienist as well. She's also taught to talk really, really weird. My name is Dr. Paul Goodman, Dr. Nacho, and I am helping dentists and hygienists everywhere not talk weird. So I've come up with five words you should not say in a dental office. Five words that will make your patients feel scared, feel weird, feel afraid, and make you unlikable. So what are these five words? So we're gonna go through, don't say this, say this. The first word is fail or failed. There's no reason we have to look at a patient who've had, who's had a bridge in place for 20 years and say, Millie, your bridge has failed. It's unlikable, it's mean, and it doesn't even make sense because cars don't last that long. So instead of failed, how about we say this? Hey, Millie, it's time to replace your bridge. So don't say fail, say replace. What's next? My personal favorite, the one that makes you feel so weird on the inside when you say it. If a tooth does not have a filling, we are taught to call those teeth virgins. Does that make you feel comfortable to hear the word virgin? Instead of saying virgin, how about saying tooth without a filling? This tooth doesn't have a filling, not that it's a virgin. The third thing 
is save. We often say to patients, we can't save this tooth. So dramatic, like it's private premolar Ryan and Tom Hanks is coming to save it. So instead of that, say, hey, the cavity here has gotten so deep, we cannot maintain this tooth. So to review, don't say fail, say replace. Don't say virgin, say tooth without a filling. Don't say save, say maintain. We have two more. Informed consent, so dramatic. I'm gonna give you an informed consent for a root canal. Now, what could you call an informed consent? A heads up. I'm gonna give you a heads up what can happen. So you can have an informed consent form where it says informed consent, but as you bring it to life for patients, say, I'm gonna give you a heads up. Most of the time things go really, really well, but these are some things you should know about your procedure. I'm gonna give you a heads up, whether it's a root canal, scaling and root planing a crown. And the final one is the P word. Do not say this P word. And that P word is policy. No one likes to hear that word. You don't like it, I don't like it, and our patients don't like it. So you may have a financial policy where everyone pays before treatment. That's cool. But instead of saying policy, why don't you call it protocol? So don't say policy, say protocol. So these are the five words you should not say to be less weird and more likable in the dental office. Don't say fail, say replaced. Don't say virgin, say tooth without a filling. Don't say save, say maintained. Don't say informed consent, say heads up. Don't say policy, say protocol. If I can help you in any way, just reach out to me at dentalnachos.com. It is my life's goal to help you talk less weird.